Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Jonathan Sullivan, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the third of our five webinars in this series, Building a Better Disciple, a Blueprint for the Christian Life. Uh, tonight, we will be discussing Christian community, and what does it mean to be part of a Christian community, and what does that mean for our journey of discipleship as we seek to unite ourselves and, and follow more closely Jesus Christ. Uh, as always, I want to start the webinar with a prayer. Uh, a little later in the webinar, we'll be discussing uh, a couple of quotes from Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. And so I thought for our opening prayer tonight that we would use the prayer at the end of that apostolic exhortation, uh, a prayer to uh, the, the Blessed Virgin, uh, invoking her uh, prayers on behalf of us and for the good of the church. So I invite you to get yourself comfortable uh, and put yourself into a uh, place of prayer as we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Mary, Virgin and Mother, you who, moved by the Holy Spirit, welcomed the word of life in the depths of your humble faith. As you gave yourself completely to the Eternal One, help us to say our own yes to the urgent call, as pressing as ever, to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Filled with Christ's presence, you brought joy to John the Baptist, making him exalt in the womb of his mother. Brimming over with joy, you see great things done by God. Standing at the foot of the cross with unyielding faith, you receive the joyful comfort of the resurrection and join the disciples in awaiting the Spirit so that the evangelizing church might be born. Obtain for us now a new ardor born of the resurrection that we may bring to all the gospel of life which triumphs over death. Give us a holy courage to seek new paths, that the gift of unfading beauty may reach every man and woman. Virgin of listening and contemplation, Mother of love, Bride of the eternal wedding feast, pray for the church, whose pure icon you are, that she may never be closed in on herself or lose her passion for establishing God's kingdom. Star of the new evangelization, help us to bear radiant witness to communion, service, generous faith, justice and love of the poor, that the joy of the gospel may reach to the ends of the earth, illuminating even the fringes of our world. Mother of the living gospel, wellspring of happiness for God's little ones, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, again, welcome. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sullivan. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time tonight, I am the Director of Catechetical Services for the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois. Uh, it's been my uh, pleasure to serve there now for almost six and a half years. Uh, I'm originally from Kansas City, and I would really like to give a big thank uh, tonight to Major League Baseball for not scheduling a World Series game tonight. Uh, as you can imagine, I've been following that pretty anxiously, so uh, thankfully uh, didn't have to miss a game tonight. Uh, very anxious for tomorrow night, though, obviously. Uh, I am married. Uh, my wife and I are expecting our seventh child in February. And you can find out more about me and see some of my writings and other videos at my website, jonathanfsullivan.com. Now, as we've done the last few nights, I also want to find out a little bit about you and find out who is in the room tonight, as it were, to see who's with us. We've got about 40 people uh, attending the webinar tonight, but I want to find out a little bit about who you are, get a sense of what your role is in your different places. So uh, on your screen, you should see a poll uh, with a few options. The poll question is, what is your role in your particular diocese or parish? Are you a catechist or a teacher, a catechetical leader? That would be a DRE or a principal, things like that. A uh, priest or a deacon, a uh, liturgist or musicians. Or are you just uh, an other or just an interested member of the faithful who uh, wanted to, uh, to participate tonight? Uh, whatever your role, you are most welcome, and we are glad you are here. I'm going to give folks just a few more seconds to make their choice on the poll. Looks like we've got about 90% of you who have chosen, so I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. And then we'll see 
uh, how everyone responded. Looks like about 53% of you are a catechist or a teacher, 42% catechetical leaders, and 6% others. So, uh, again, welcome to you all. Glad that you are all able to participate tonight. Always glad to see so many catechists and teachers with us. Uh, we are so grateful for the service that you do in our parishes and in our Catholic schools. So a few reminders, uh, if you've participated in one of my webinars before, uh, those were more informational delivery type of webinars, uh, a little more my, me talking and you listening. Uh, this webinar series is a little different. We're aiming for something a little more personal, a little more reflective, a little more spiritual development uh, style. So there are going to be opportunities to respond, and I really invite you to do so uh, whenever you see the uh, question pop up uh, that will be thrown out. Uh, you'll be asked to open up the GoToWebinar control panel, which can be done by clicking that little orange arrow button. If the control panel closes, you can click on that arrow to open and close it, and then go into the question box and answer, or type your answers into that space. And uh, that will show up on my screen, and I'll be able to read those out so that we can all participate. Uh, as we've done the last couple of times, uh, because you know I do want to respect people's privacy, I will only use first names uh, when uh, saying who is responding to the questions. I don't feel like you have to, uh, you know, pick and choose which questions you want to participate in, but uh, I've been really pleased uh, with this series so far with the participation that people have been uh, willing to engage in. So again, thank you if you've been participating in, in the past two webinars for your participation. It's really, uh, really has made this something uh, very different and very special uh, in terms of the, the types of webinars I normally do. So thank you. A uh, quick overview. The past two uh, webinars, we've discussed Jesus uh, and what Jesus means for discipleship, looking at Jesus as kind of the template for what it means to be uh, one of his disciples. Last week, we looked at scripture and tradition as the boundaries of discipleship. And what we were kind of aiming for that uh, with that metaphor is looking at scripture and tradition as kind of the boundary lines. If you imagine a, a playing field on a soccer field or a football field, we need the boundary lines so we can play the game. If there's no boundary lines, then we don't know what's in, what's out. We don't know how to proceed. We don't know what the end goal is. Uh, by the great gift of God's revelation to us uh, through sacred tradition and sacred scripture, we know what the goal is. We know what the boundaries are. We know uh, when we are playing uh, rightly within the game and uh, when we've stepped out of bounds and need to be brought back in uh, through the gift of reconciliation. So that's kind of what we looked at last week. This week again we'll be looking at Christian community. What does it mean to be a member of the community of Jesus Christ and what does that mean for our journey of discipleship? Next week we'll be looking at liturgy and prayer and what they tell us about discipleship and uh, then we'll end the series on November 10th with a look at the mission. What does it need to be a disciple in the world, and how do we uh, discern what we're called to do in our particular situations? So with that, we will get started for the evening and take a look at Christian Community, the Foundation of Discipleship. And as I was preparing for this series, uh, when I came to the topic of Christian Community, uh, the image that really came to my mind was that image of a foundation, that it's what we are building upon, what has come before us, uh, the great gift of community and tradition and uh, the great history of the church and all the great saints and even in some cases sinners uh, that have gone before us, that we are building our own discipleship upon. And, and we need that foundation. We need to set ourselves on. And the Christian community gives that to, to us. It gives us a sense of belonging and place and rootedness, so that we're not just being uh, rocked about on uh, on the, the stormy seas, as it were, uh, but we have a place where we can place ourselves and be, uh, that gives us a place to return to when we do go astray. Um, you know, we, we need that sense of community to really be rooted in Christ, to be rooted uh, in his church. So the first uh, piece I want to look at tonight, then, is kind of what is a community? How do we understand community in a Christian sense? And whenever we think about community, I think the first thing we always have to think about is the Holy Trinity. Because in many ways, the Holy Trinity exemplifies community for us. Because God himself is a community. Three persons in one God, united in perfect love. That, for us, is the central mystery of our faith. 
uh, we can never fully plumb its depths. We can never fully understand what this three persons and one God is. But what we do know is it is itself a community because these three people are in relationship to one another, even though they are one. And so whenever we think about community, our starting point is always the Trinity, who shows us what true relationship, what true community is all about. Now, the next place we want to look, though, is what does, then does it mean to be part of a human community? And uh, are there some people that are in that community and some people that are, aren't? And I think a, a wonderful statement about that comes from Nostra Aetate, the, uh, the Vatican II's declaration on uh, the relation of the church to non-Christian religions. And right at the very start, and this is the first paragraph of that document, there's a wonderful quote where the Council Fathers say, All men form but one community. I and mean, we could just stop right there and just reflect on that. All men, all people form but one community. This is so because all stem from the one stock which God create, created to people the entire earth, and also because all share a common destiny, namely God. His providence, evident goodness, and saving designs extend to all men against the day when the elect are gathered together in the holy city, which is illumined by the glory of God. So right from the very start we see all people make up one human community. So we have things in common with all of the people, regardless of their race, regardless of their creed, regardless of whether they acknowledge God or not. Uh, we share something in common, that we all come from this, this one people, this one humanity. And this is why the church uh, is so insistent that all people share in dignity, all in, in basic human dignity and, and basic human freedom, because we share a common human nature that as we saw in the first webinar, has been elevated because Christ took on our humanity through the Incarnation. But the Church's insistent then that all people share that humanity. We have something in common so that we can never break that bond with one another, no matter how uh, horrible circumstances may be, no matter how different other people or uh, other cultures or other nations may seem. There's always something in common, even if it's something as simple as uh, Sharing a meal. I, I remember hearing once uh, a story about someone who was doing uh, really hard diplomacy in the Middle East. Uh, this was, I think, back like in the 70s. I think it was someone from the Carter administration who had gone to the Middle East and was trying to really engage in diplomatic relations and trying to get uh, you know, the, the different groups there to, to come together. And what this person said was the, the starting real breakthrough started to come was when they set aside all the meetings and they set aside all the agendas and they just sat down and had a meal together with no agenda, no topic, you know, just sitting down having a meal together. And suddenly people started engaging in real human conversation, talking about families, talking about children, talking about different interests and hobbies, getting to know one another just as people. You know, when we recognize that we share that common humanity with all other people, it helps us to make those connections. It helps us to recognize that we are part of one human community. And this echoes St. Paul, obviously, who said there is no Jew or Greek. You know, in Christ, all these divisions have been just swept aside uh, because Christ took on our humanity and united all people in him. Even if some reject him, he has united all people in him, in that one human family. So a wonderful reminder from uh, the, the Council Fathers at the Second Vatican Council. Uh, all people form but one community. Now, as I said at the beginning, though, community is so important because within the particular Christian community, we discover what it means to really be a Christian. We need that rootedness in the church. We need that unfolding of uh, time and people throughout that leads up to where we're at now to, to, to root ourselves. And so in many senses, what we're going to be talking about today is the fact that it's within community that we learn what it truly means to be a Christian. And, uh, I, I can think of no better statement on that than from the right of Christian initiation of adults. Uh, if, if there's anyone uh, joining involved in the RCIA, uh, I hope you're very, very familiar with, with paragraph 75, because in many ways it, it, it is the crux of uh, the catechetical program of the RCIA that really outlines what is it we're trying to form people in uh, when we're bringing them through this process of initiation. But part of that paragraph says that, as they become familiar with the Christian way of life and are helped by the example and support of sponsors, godparents, and the entire Christian community, the catechumens, that is, those who are preparing to be received into the church, 
uh, through baptism and confirmation and Eucharist at the Easter Vigil, the catechumens learn to turn more readily to God in prayer, to bear witness to the faith, in all things to keep their hope set on Christ, to follow supernatural inspiration in their deeds, and to practice love for neighbor, neighbor even at the cost of self renunciation What this is telling us is that this whole catechetical program, which we have to remind ourselves is for everyone. I mean, this particular paragraph is from the RCIA, but this is true of all catechesis. It always takes place in the context of community. It's with the, the help and the example and the support of all the people in that Christian community that we learn to do these things, that we learn to uh, witness to the faith and rely on God in prayer and keeps our, keep our hopes set on Christ. It's the community that teaches us to do these things. Now, there's an interesting implication on that. The implication is that the Christian community is actually practicing these things, that the Christian community is praying, that it's bearing witness to the faith, that it's keeping their hopes set on Christ and following supernatural inspiration and practicing love of neighbor. Uh, it, you know, it implies that the community is actually doing those things in order to be able to pass it on to those who will be joining the church. What we're seeing here is that catechesis is more than just book learning. Uh, when we seek to pass on the faith, it's more than just academic knowledge. It's about a way of life. It's a, a transmission of culture and belief, uh, a way of seeing things. And we don't just get that out of a book. You can't just hand someone the catechism, have them read it front to back, and, and suddenly have them be a practicing Christian. Uh, diocesan director for worship in the catechumen it often likes to say that there's a real importance to rubbing shoulders with other believers uh, even outside of you know liturgical and quote unquote churchy context just being with other Christians is going to inform you about what the Christian life is about and so just in sharing meals and uh, having fun with and and just like I said rubbing shoulders with other Christians that's going to rub off on us and is going to help us to develop a Christian life and a Christian worldview and a Christian way of seeing things. Uh, it helps expose us to various ways of being a disciple because within that community there's lots of individuals, a real diversity of individuals. And so being in that community, rubbing shoulders with folks, will help us to see that there's no one way of being a Christian. Uh, just take the picture that's on the screen right now. You see various poses, various responses, various ways of being in this uh, in this situation of prayer and praise on the screen. Diversity within the one community, being part of a Christian community, will teach us that, uh, and that we should never be afraid of diversity within the church because the church is diverse. Uh, we have so many different ways of of being Christian, of different spiritualities, of different. Uh, traditions from the saints and different religious communities and so on, uh, you know, being a part of the community is going to remind us that we can find our path within, as we talked about last week, uh, those boundaries of discipleship, uh, those generous boundaries. You know, we can find our own way and our own way of being Christian by being exposed to various types of Christians in the community. So the first question I want to throw out tonight is, who showed you what it means to be a Christian by their practice of the faith? Who is it that you rubbed shoulders with? Who is it that you were exposed to, uh, maybe as a young person, maybe as you grew older? Who was it that showed you what it meant to be a Christian just by the way they acted, just by the way that they, they practiced their faith? So take a moment and open up that GoToMeeting control panel uh, by clicking on that orange arrow button and, and type your response in, and we'll see what folks have to say tonight. Uh, you know, in my own life, I can think of a number of different people who have done that for me. Right now, I think a lot of it is just the, the wonderful people I get to work with in our diocese, in our Department of Catechetical Services. Uh, there's such a, a wonderful diversity of, like I said, spiritualities and ways of praying, uh, and yet they all have a piece of it, and they all show such wonderful faith and wonderful service to uh, our, our offices and our diocese. And it's been a real inspiration for me, and it's really helped me to appreciate um, some of the different gifts that they bring to the church. So we have another number of responses here. I'll just read some of these off. Colleagues, yeah, absolutely, as I was just talking about. The people we work with, uh, especially those of us that get to work in parishes or Catholic schools, can be a wonderful source of inspiration uh, for what it means to practice the faith. Uh, sorry, these are going by a little fast here. Uh, my mom and grandma, very good. Uh, my grandmother, my parents, my mother, grandmother, uh, my mother and sisters who taught me in school. Uh, sisters there being capitalized, I'm assuming you mean religious sisters there, absolutely. And just 
Catholic school teachers in general, I think, are a, a wonderful source of uh, passing on the faith to that next generation, both by what they explicitly teach in the classroom and just the way they live their, live their lives and the example of prayer and service that they, they bring. Uh, my longtime friend who I went to Catholic school with, Karen, yeah. Uh, for me, it is all my f uh, faith family members at 6.30 a.m. Mass uh, and uh, Stephen Minister friends. Very good. Uh, my parents were the primary formers of my religiosity and faith. Also, the Jesuits in my school lived out the Christian message to me. Obviously, parents first. Later, when I was an adult, I have to say that Bishop Kemi was such an unbelievable inspiration as an example of faith. Uh, uh, I'm, oh, I guess. Uh, Bishop Kemi, now Bishop of, uh, of Wichita, Kansas, uh, former Vicar General of our diocese, wonderful man of faith. Uh, we were very sorry to lose him to Wichita uh, earlier this year. Uh, I look to the faith of those who I serve in the parish. Yeah, our fellow parishioners can be a wonderful example. Uh, you know, the, the people that we see uh, every Sunday and even at daily Mass, uh, a friend in my prayer group, parents mostly, but also family and friends of the parish, uh, my mom and the other volunteers uh, who went monthly to the downtown Kansas City, Missouri homeless shelter to help and share the word with the homeless. Uh, absolutely, you know, and what a, a, what a great example of living the faith uh, in a very real way in terms of service. Uh, I'm not sure which homeless shelter you're talking about in Kansas City, Missouri. I know when I was growing up uh, outside Kansas City, uh, we would go to Shalom House from time to time. Uh, my best friend's family actually would go there monthly to to uh, cook a meal, and I would often join them. Uh, what, what a wonderful place that was to go and, and share faith with the men who were uh, living there. Uh, neighbors and close friends that took me to church when my mother was suffering with cancer. Uh, I was a teenager. Uh, yeah. Grandfather, your grandfather, parents, grandmother, uh, aunt, uh, Dinah and Mr. Patrick, uh, mom was suffering, uh, yeah, uh, a priest I knew in the military. Uh, yeah, military chaplains, I don't know what it is about military chaplains, but they have a, they have a real interesting perspective, I think, when it comes to the faith and, and the way faith is lived out. I think because they see people in such dire circumstances somehow, sometimes, that, uh, you know, they really bring a, a a real groundedness to the faith. Uh, my Just Faith graduate community, who are in the process of transforming our parish community. Uh, just Faith, yeah, great program. Uh, we've had a couple of parishes in our diocese do Just Faith. And yeah, it can really uh, transform a parish when you have a group that uh, really takes that seriously. Uh, a men's work group who came to my house and moved me from there to another place. They loved me in the awfulness of my move. Uh, my close friend, my grandmother, all of the catechists who I work with. Good. Wonderful. Well, you, we can see, I mean, what a, a variety of, of answers, a variety of types of people that we see in our lives who have, who have not necessarily by directly teaching us, but just by their example, the way that they lived, the way that they rubbed off on us, have, have showed us what it means to be a disciple and have helped us on our journey of discipleship. So, great. That, thank you so much for your sharing and for... Uh, uh, for uh, giving us all these great examples. Thank you. So next I want to talk a little bit about the domestic church, and that may or may not be a phrase that you're familiar with, but it's a phrase that uh, we saw in the early church, uh, but has really come to prom prominence again since the Second Vatican Council, uh, where in the uh, Lumen, uh, no, uh, in the document, uh, the Constitution on the Church, uh, talked about the domestic church. And what the domestic church is, is the family. Uh, and what we've come to rediscover in the years since the Second Vatican Council, when this idea started to come to the fore again, is the importance of the family as the primary community in which we find ourselves. Um, the Christian family is really the most important community in which we are members, because it's our first community. It's the community into which we are born. It's the community that we don't really get to choose. You know, we, we can't choose our family members. Uh, it's, it's where we start. And so it's foundational for us as we go throughout life for our understanding of God and our understanding of church and our understanding of what it means to be a person in the world. Uh, in many ways, though, it's, it's the basic unit of the church, the family is. 
And that may seem counterintuitive in some ways, because we're not saying that the individual is the most basic unit of the church. It's the family. And again, that's because the church itself is a community. And so the basic unit has to be a community. Uh, you can't go from a singular and go into a community. You have to start with a community to then build more communities. And the Pope St. John Paul II and Familiaris Consortio, his wonderful document on the Christian family, has this wonderful line where he says, the Christian family constitutes a specific revelation and realization of ecclesial communion. And for this reason, too, it can and should be called the domestic church. That is, the Christian family shows us what it means to be church. It's a specific revelation and realization of the church, of the communion we find ourselves in within the Catholic Church. The, 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 the Christian family is the church, and so we call it the domestic church, because it's the church in small. Uh, in the early church, some people even called it not the domestic church, but the little church, uh, because you know, it's the small community out of which this larger community flows. Now, the catechism... Uh, helps us to kind of unpack this a little bit, uh, when it says the Christian family is a communion of persons, a sign and image of the communion of the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. In the procreation and education of children, it reflects the Father's work of creation. It is called to partake of the prayer and sacrifice of Christ. Daily prayer and the reading of the word of God strengthen it in charity. The Christian family has an evangelizing and missionary task. So again, pointing us towards the Trinity as the basis of all commun communions and communities. And the Christian family reflects that. The Christian family shows us what the Trinity is in some small way. Uh, now, I, I want to point out, this is true even when a couple are unable to have children. Uh, it still reflects that communion of the Trinity. Uh, because that, that work of creation is still taking place, even if not necessarily in procreation. So just because a couple uh, marries and, for whatever reason, is unable to have children, uh, doesn't mean that they don't reflect that reality of the Trinity. It doesn't mean that they are not a domestic church, uh, and not, as John Paul II said, a specific revelation and realization of the church. Uh, that is one way in which the church participate, or the family participates and reflects that reality of the Trinity, but it's not the only way. Uh, so I, I don't want to leave the impression that uh, couples who can't have children aren't "quote unquote" real families or "quote unquote" real domestic churches. They absolutely are, uh, even if that aspect of it uh, is is not there. What I, what I really want to look at for a moment is the, the whole sacrament of matrimony as a sign of Christ's love for the church, uh, as that participation in the life of the Trinity, and specifically the relationship of Christ to the church. Marriage models for us Christ's union with his church. Christ has, in a sense, married the church. Uh, and you often see this reflected even in the prayers of the church uh, around marriage and matrimony. And so, for instance, in the second preface to the Eucharistic prayer, in the rite of marriage, you see this wonderful little uh, paragraph here on the screen. In the union of husband and wife, you, meaning God, gave a sign of Christ's loving gift of grace, so that the sacrament we celebrate might draw us back more deeply into the wondrous design of your love. So the union of husband and wife is a sign of Christ's loving gift of grace, that in that union of, of man and woman, we see the life of Christ, the loving gift of Christ, reflected back to us. This is why marriage is a sacrament, because it reveals Christ's grace to us. It, it makes manifest the grace of Christ in our lives. So the husband and wife cleave to each other just as Christ cleaves to his church. You know, this is one of the reasons why the church has always insisted on the insolubility of marriage, because if we say that marriage is a reflection of Christ's relationship with the church, well, Christ will never turn his back on the church. And so just the same, we cannot say then that a, a man and a woman who have been lawfully wed can just turn their backs on each other. They've made a vow and a promise to be together until Death do them part. And Christ has given us the same promise. And so if, if we say that marriage can be just dissolved just because, for whatever reason, uh, then we start to say that maybe Christ can do the same with us. And, and that's not the promise that Christ has given. Christ has promised to be with us until the end of the age. 
And so we always try to strive for that reality uh, when we form people for marriage, when we, when we support people in their marriages, uh, and all throughout their lives. So all family members then have a responsibility to build up that family community because it reflects the life of the Trinity. It reflects Christ's relationship with the church. We're all called then as members of families to help to build up the families uh, that we are a part of. And the, the church says that this is especially evident in the education of children. Now, when it talks about education of children, that's more than just schooling or imparting academic knowledge. It's more than just uh, stuffing little brains with facts and figures and, and all of that. It's really talking about the formation of the whole person, and especially the formation of children as disciples uh, of Jesus Christ. And again, when we look at uh, the, the prayers and the rituals of the church, this comes out really clearly, uh, especially in the rite of baptism for children. Uh, at the very beginning of the rite of baptism for children, at the reception of the child, uh, the minister at, says to the parents, you have asked to have your child baptized. In doing so, you are accepting the responsibility of training her in the practice of the faith. It will be your duty to bring her up to keep God's commandments as Christ taught us by loving God and our neighbor. And then the minister asks, do you clearly understand what you are undertaking? And then turns to the godparents and says, are you ready to help the parents of this child in their duty as Christian parents? So being very clear to the parents, this is your duty. This is your uh, uh, what you are being called to do for this child. If, if you're going to have them baptized, you must raise them up uh, as disciples. And then it's such a big job that it's not just up to the parents, but the godparents in turn are asked, will you support and help these parents do that? Because it's more than just two people can do. Uh, you know, it, it takes that whole community. And so the godparents are, in some sense, standing there on behalf of the Christian community to say, yes, we will help uh, these, these parents uh, to raise their children. And then interestingly, later in the, in the rite of baptism, the parents are told again uh, that you must make it your constant you must make it your constant care to bring her up in the practice of the faith. So again, reiterating, this is your duty to raise your child in the practice of the faith. Uh, so it hits that over and over again uh, in, in the rite of baptism, that, that duty of raising children in the faith. So it's that formation of the whole person. It's about cultivation of the virtues. It's about practicing the works of mercy. It's about extending mercy and reconciliation. Uh, it's about practicing all those things in the context of the family. And, you know, that's not always an easy thing. It takes a lot of work to do that. It's accomplished through regular practice of prayer. When we talk about you know, praying before meals, praying at night, praying as a family, uh, celebrating Sunday Eucharist together as a family, which uh, unfortunately, I mean, anecdotally at least in our diocese, you know, we see fewer and fewer, even kids in PSR programs, but kids in Catholic school, participating in that, that Sunday celebration of the Eucharist. And yet we know that if we want our kids to continue to practice the faith later in life, the best way we can help them to do that is to help them to celebrate Sunday Eucharist uh, on a regular weekly basis. We had one parish in our diocese I, I really loved. Uh, at the start of their school year, they handed out bumper stickers to all the parents. It said, Catholic education begins with Sunday Mass. I thought, what a great message that what we do on those five days of the week when the kids are in school can only take root, can only really be effective if we're there on, at, at Mass on Sunday. You know, that's where it starts. Everything else flows out of there. Uh, so about celebrating Sunday, it, it's about our communal life together, working together, uh, doing chores together, uh, participating in apostolic works, going and helping in a soup kitchen, helping a neighbor, things like that. And I think especially uh, learning to forgive. I think that's one of the biggest things in our families that we can teach our children is the importance of forgiveness and the importance of reconciliation. Uh, and that's there's a lot of opportunities to practice that in a family. <laughs> I think we all know uh, whether it's you know uh, your boys bumping into each other or uh, you know making fun of their sister, pulling pigtails, you know whatever it is. Uh, you can tell I have younger kids in my <laughs> my household. Uh, but there's lots of opportunities to practice that forgiveness just because of the reality of of day to day living together. Uh, again. Pope St. John Paul II said in Familiaris Consortio, 
Family communion can only be preserved and perfected through a great spirit of sacrifice. It requires, in fact, a ready and generous openness of each and all to understanding, to forbearance, to pardon, to reconciliation. So that sense of self-sacrifice for our families, you know, we always need to be practicing that and being the example of that to our kids so that uh, as they grow up in life, uh, they'll be able to uh, put that into practice as disciples. Uh, before I jump into the next question real quick, a, a question uh, from Nicole. What about single parents? Are they considered domestic families? Yes, absolutely, of course. Uh, again, uh, certain elements uh, may not be able to be practiced, again, in terms of continued procreation uh, of children and things like that. But absolutely, uh, anytime you have a family union, whether that's an adopted families, whatever it is, absolutely, those are still considered uh, domestic churches and are you know, reflect that reality of the Trinity and reflect the, the entire ecclesial communion in which we are a part of. So great question. Thank you. So the next question I want to pose then is, how has your family helped you grow in the faith? How have they been a domestic church uh, in your life? Uh, what does that look like for you? What examples can you give? So again, open up your GoToMeeting control panel by clicking the orange arrow button and typing into that uh, question panel, uh, what that looks like. And again, uh, I, I think some folks may have been confused. That the, uh, you need to click into that space there where it says enter a question for staff, and that's where you actually type in your question. Uh, so I'm sorry if I, I wasn't clear about that, but it's, it's not necessarily the bigger box there, but where it says enter a question for staff. So uh, give folks a few minutes to type that in. You know, as I think of uh, one way my family was uh, domestic church when I was younger, uh, I was a swimmer growing up. That was my sport of choice. And so we were often on weekends on the road at least once a month, if not more, uh, to various cities uh, across the Midwest for various swim meets. And no matter what, wherever we were, whether it was Milwaukee or uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas or Wichita or wherever we went to, uh, we always made it to Mass on Sunday. And not just because it was our duty or something like that. I think for my dad, what it really was, is he loved seeing new churches. He loved going and visiting and seeing the architecture and seeing stained glass windows and seeing all the great variety of churches and the various places that we would go and visit. So that, that really rubbed off on me uh, to the point where, you know, when I, whenever I go to a new city, I love going and seeing the churches. and uh, It's one of the, the great joys actually in my diocesan work is as I get to travel across our diocese. Uh, whenever I visit a, a parish or a school, I always, if it's open, try to stick my head into the church just to, just to be a little nosy and look around and, and see the, the art and the statues and see the, what all the different churches in our diocese look like. I really enjoy that. And so uh, that sense of being connected to the building uh, that I got from my father who always enjoyed visiting churches, that's one way in which my family uh, really helped me to appreciate the wider church. Uh, Joe says, my boys make me pray very regularly. Uh, amen to that. I think anyone who has children would agree. Uh, we have to pray pretty regularly for them, and, and they give us plenty of opportunities to do that. Uh, Patricia says, my family has taught me love and patience. They give me opportunities to love and be patient. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying I can never... I, I don't know what the exact wording of it uh, originally was, but, uh, you know, if you ask God for virtue, if you ask God for patience or wisdom, uh, God will give you opportunities to practice it. Uh, <laughs> it's not just that you're going to be, you know, shot with a lightning bolt and given it perfectly right at the first shot, but God's going to give you opportunities to, to practice that. So don't be surprised if you ask, if you ask for patience, uh, God will give it to you in the form of plenty of opportunities to practice. <laughs> and families are a wonderful example of that. Uh, Francis says, primarily by praying together, however, my family members promoting mortification and sacrifice demonstrated to me the domestic church in my life. Yeah, the, the, those self-sacrifices and the way we, uh, the little sacrifices we make and then, and then offering those sacrifices as a way of uh, growing in the faith and, and on behalf of others, giving spiritual gifts to others through that sacrifice, absolutely, uh, is a great example. Attending Mass together has always been a wonderful family activity. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I hope as I get older and my kids get older, it will become more wonderful. Uh, we, have, we have two little ones right now who uh, are very active in the pews. <laughs> 
Uh, Vicky says, my parents always pointed out what was right and wrong. They were very supportive. Our family never missed a Sunday or Holy Day Mass. Yeah, again, that, that practice of the faith when you're young, especially uh, being attentive to, to Sunday Mass, uh, is, the, I think, one of the best ways we can help young people to continue to practice the faith as they're older. And again, I think studies have, have really borne that out. Joe says, family prayer time, hearing the innocence and beauty of prayer of young kids. Yeah, they, they lay it all out there, don't they? They're, they're not afraid of prayer. I think as we get older, sometimes we get a little bit timid in our prayer lives. Or, eh, is this really appropriate to be praying for? You know, I want this thing. But kids just lay it all out there. <laughs> Nancy says, they taught me how to pray and a constant reminder of the importance of prayer. Absolutely. Uh, Tamara says, my parents always took us to church on Sunday, and we went to Sunday school, as did my parents. And what a great example there. Uh, you know, too often we see people who uh, hit confirmation or hit the end of Catholic school, and that's kind of the end of their faith formation. Uh, but we know that faith formation is an ongoing, lifelong process, and adult faith formation is the foundation of catechesis in our church. Uh, whenever you... The church talks about catechesis. It always points out that adults should be the first one being formed and forming themselves. So what a great example for you to see your parents engaged in ongoing faith formation. Michelle says, encouraging church attendance, participating in the sacraments and holy days, creating religious traditions in the home. And that's a great example of, of domestic church. When we create little traditions in our house, and, and the church gives us lots of opportunities to do that, but there's also wonderful ways we can do that ourselves. I, my best friend's family, I, I always remember this one, and I try to look it up. I need to ask them sometime where they got this tradition. I, I want to say it was an ethnic tradition from one of their backgrounds, but during Lent every year, they would hang up a paper black bird uh, in the hallway, and over the course of Lent, every time they passed the bird, they would smack it and say, a light overcomes darkness. And so by the end of Lent, that tattered black bird was in pretty bad shape, and it was to reflect that we overcome sin. The black bird represented sin and darkness, uh, and so throughout Lent, reminding ourselves, we overcome that darkness, and, and, and culminating in the great Easter feast, uh, when the, that black bird is completely demolished. So, yeah, those kind of traditions we can, uh, we can seek to foster in our homes, especially, are wonderful. Uh, Catherine says, uh, by becoming wholly unselfish parents, uh, yeah, parents are a wonderful example of, of uh, holiness and, and uh, self-sacrifice. Uh, Christine says, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to explain my faith to my children. It has strengthened my faith tremendously. Uh, Lawson says, I did not grow up Catholic. My domestic church were the ones who loved their faith. They showed it to me by their action. Uh, Margaret says, our family celebrations and get-togethers, uh, it is just in being together, living, laughing, and love. Absolutely, and, and sometimes it really is in, in those just regular domestic moments that uh, we really see what it means to be a domestic church, just being together, loving each other, laughing absolutely, and we're going to talk about... Uh, talk about that in a little bit at the end of the webinar tonight. Michelle says, my kids humble me with their innocence and goodness. Alana says, I feel it is my responsibility to continue my faith to be an example for my children. Uh, Barbara says, parish life was a family activity, whether it was going to mass, attending and volunteering at parish events and outreach opportunities. Uh, my sister and I never watched my parents participate. We all participated. We also practiced the Sunday routine of mass, uh, breakfast with extended family, then visiting shut-ins before we went to grandma's for Sunday dinner. Uh, yeah, and what a great uh, way to extend what we do in the Mass. You know, at the end of the Mass, go forth. Uh, and we have lots of options now, what that uh, that ending sounds like. You know, one of my favorites is, uh, go forth proclaiming the gospel with your lives. Uh, you know, that's what we're called to do. And so what we do at Mass doesn't just end when we leave the church, but we're to take that into the world uh, and uh, practice it. So, yeah, that kind of practice of going and, and visiting folks who can't get out of their own homes on a Sunday is a, a great example. Uh, Kristen says, my mom taught me the importance of relying on God for support. Great. Uh, Philpa says, for so many years I listened to my grandmother praying the rosary every day at the same hour, joining the pilgrims in the our Lady of Fatima Sanctuary, and many years later I found myself in great need of praying, and the rosary just flowed naturally. 
I was really surprised of how familiar it all sounded and happy and grateful to Grandma. Our family prays together every day, and that makes a big difference in our lives. Yeah, I think there's lots of stories out there of uh, grandmas praying the rosary and how that has really affected the lives of their grandchildren. And finally, Joe says, accepting the joy in being together during normal time makes me think that this was the joy the early Christians had in their local churches. Absolutely. Uh, they were a community. They, they uh, really had to rely on one another being uh, a religious minority in uh, in their time and place. So absolutely. They, I think they really found lots of different ways to, to be community together, which is why in that verse of Acts that we're kind of looking at over the course of this five weeks, Christian community was so central because it, it, it offered them a, a safe place, a place to be together, a place where they could relax in the midst of persecution. Wonderful. Thank you again all for uh, sharing your responses. Uh, some really wonderful stories there. I hope uh, this gives you an opportunity to, to reflect more on those stories in your own life and how your families have been domestic church. So next I want to talk a little bit about the parish community, because I think outside of our families, uh, the parish community is the Christian community most of us are most connected with uh, in our lives of faith. Now, to start with, we want to think a little bit about what is a parish, and there's a number of different ways we can define it. Uh, the first place I went when kind of looking for a definition of what is a parish was the Code of Canon Law. <laughs> and the definition there says that a parish is a definite community of the Christian faithful established on a stable basis within a particular church. The pastoral care of the parish is entrusted to a pastor as its own shepherd under the authority of the diocesan bishop. So that's a very canonical <laughs> definition uh, of what a parish is. Um, it's helpful. It tells us that a parish is stable, that it's not something that's just here one day and gone the next, but it, it's ongoing, uh, that it's entrusted to the care of a pastor, so the pastor being the shepherd of the parish, uh, and it's a community of the Christian faithful. So it's not just anyone, uh, but a parish is a community of the faithful. So that's good as far as it goes, but I, I think my favorite definition right now, at least, of what a parish is comes from Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. In the number 28 of that document, Pope Francis says, The parish is the presence of the church in a given territory, an environment for hearing God's word, for growth in the Christian life, for dialogue, proclamation, charitable outreach, worship, and celebration. In all its activities, the parish encourages and trains its members to be evangelizers. It is a community of communities a sanctuary where the thirsty come to drink in the midst of their journey, and a center of constant missionary outreach. I think this is a really deep understanding of what a parish is, a really wonderful deep definition, uh, especially that first line, the parish is the presence of the church in a given territory. So a, a parish is territorial, it has boundaries. But it's the presence of the church in that place. It is the presence of the people of God within a certain geographical area. And then again, he lays out uh, what all that means and, and the different activities that a parish does. I think we can condense that list a little bit if we wanted to, um, to look something like this, that it's a place where we proclaim God's word uh, as found in sacred scripture and sacred tradition. It's a place where we grow disciples, where we do the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, where we pray together, and where we worship together. Now, if that sounds perhaps somewhat familiar, uh, it's because, it, it, in a sense, this is Acts 2.42. This is what we've been looking at. Uh, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. Uh, the parish, in a real way, continues the work begun in the early church. It's continuing to do those things. So, to put it perhaps another way, parishes are places where disciples of Jesus Christ come together to do the things disciples do. That, for me, is kind of the, the real baseline, uh, pithy definition of, of what a parish is. Uh, it's where disciples come to do the things disciples do together. Now, most especially, I think that means coming together to celebrate Sunday Eucharist, uh, which is really the sacrament of Christian unity. Uh, that's why it's called communion. It's because we come together and come together in one union with one another through our participation in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So I think more than anything, that central activity, that central thing we do is to come together and celebrate the Eucharist together. 
because that's what Jesus asked us to do. Uh, Jesus told us to do this in memory of him. And so we come back to that again and again, Sunday after Sunday, to be reminded of that, to be reminded who we are and whose we are, uh, that we belong to Jesus Christ and to his church. Now, the parish is not the exclusive place where disciples come together to do the things disciples do. We already talked about the family as the domestic church as one place where disciples come together, a very specific group of disciples, disciples as family. But also through different apostolic groups, different lay movements in the church uh, today, uh, our special groupings of disciples who come together. Uh, religious orders are a wonderful example of uh, when people tend to come together under a particular vision, a particular charism uh, to do great works. And also, I think, small faith communities. Uh, in our diocese, uh, a few years ago, we did Why Catholic, and a lot of those uh, small white Catholic groups continue to meet and continue to uh, study and pray together and even go out and do uh, work in soup kitchens and homeless shelters and, and different apostolic works. So small faith communities are another wonderful way in which disciples come together. But I think for most people, the parish is that immediate connection between the local church, you know, that, that, that geographical area, and, uh, and themselves. It's where we most plug into that universal church, uh, connects us with that church. Uh, this is in part why during Mass we pray for union with the Pope and, and the local bishop in the Eucharistic prayer. Uh, you know, we always name them by name to remind ourselves that we are in communion with them, uh, looking towards that, that wider church. Uh, it's also why, why in the prayer of the faithful often includes prayers for the universal church, to remind ourselves that when we come together to pray, we're not just praying for our local concerns, but we're called to pray for all those folks out there as well. So the parish is what connects us then. Uh, our little domestic churches connects us then to the local bishop, through the local bishop, to the entire universal church. It helps us to, to look beyond our little parochialisms, uh, which can really, I think, Parochialism, as I see it, can really be detrimental to the life of a parish because it means the parish is just looking in on itself and at its own concerns and its own needs. It's not looking beyond its own borders. Uh, too often this kind of a mindset keeps us from working together, even with other Catholics in our towns and cities. Uh, you know, we often see it where, you know, that parish over there, you know, that's, uh, you know, we don't talk to them for whatever reason. Sometimes it goes back to old ethnic parishes and, and strife between different ethnicities uh, in the church. But uh, you know, when, when parishes start to become parochial in, in the worst sense of the word, it can be really detrimental to uh, the life of discipleship and, and the great works that we're called to do in our local communities. So um, always remind ourselves that when we come together as parishes, we always seek to look beyond just our own walls uh, towards that fuller universal sense of the church. So Again, what keeps us from fulfilling this kind of vision of, of parish life? What keeps us from uh, being a place where uh, we're really able to reach outside of ourselves? Well, again, Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium has a wonderful sense, I think, of, of why that might be. He says, we must recognize that if part of our baptized people lack a sense of belonging to the church, this is also due to certain structures and occasionally unwelcoming atmosphere in some of our parishes and communities or to a bureaucratic way of dealing with problems, be they simple or complex, in the lives of our people. In many places, an administrative approach prevails over a pastoral approach, as does a concentration on administering the sacraments apart from other forms of evangelization. Now, let's be clear, Pope Francis is not saying administering the sacraments is bad. <laughs> um, that's absolutely central to you know, what the church is about. What he's saying is that when we concentrate on just those things, we can seek to, or we can neglect the other types of evangelization that we're called to do, some of which can be much more foundational than even administering the sacraments. Um, Sherry Weddle, in her book Forming Intentional Disciples, talks about this tendency in the church uh, that's persisted for a number of decades now on sacramentalizing people, but not evangelizing them. In other words, you know, just doing a perfunctory baptism or confirmation or First Communion without really seeking to evangelize people, without seeking to uh, introduce them to the person of Jesus Christ and, and making sure that they're progressing in their life of faith. Uh, and this can be really detrimental to the, the life of a person because without a proper disposition to receiving the sacraments, 
the grace of the sacraments can be imparted, but they're not going to bear any fruit. In other words, if a child is baptized, but then uh, their parents never take them to church, never raise them in the faith, uh, never seek to raise them as a disciple of Jesus Christ, they've been baptized, they've received that, the grace of that sacrament, but the fruit of that grace, the fruit of that sacrament is never going to take place in their lives. Now, God willing, and, and we pray that that person later down the line might have a conversion experience, might be evangelized by someone, might be uh, drawn into the life of Christ. And at that point, that baptism may finally start to bear fruit in their lives. But until that happens, if they haven't been dis disposed to receive the graces and to receive them fruitfully, uh, the, the grace can be imparted, but it's not going to have a real effect in their lives. And so that's part of what Pope Francis is talking about here, that when we're only concerned with administering the sacraments, we can actually be doing more harm with good if we're not seeking to evangelize people, if we're not seeking to ensure that they are going to receive the grace of the sacraments and a fruit through their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, of course, then he also, in, the, in this paragraph, talks about a number of other problems, and I think we can all probably name different examples of, of these in, in our different communities, that uh, we bureaucratize uh, the workings within our church instead of seeking to reach out to people in relationship and with mercy. Uh, you know, we put up roadblocks, uh, administrative roadblocks sometimes, that uh, it seeks to, to push people away more than it does to draw them in. Um, that can be things like... Uh, you know, if someone's in a regular marriage and wants to come and participate in something, you know, sometimes we say, well, until you get all your ducks in the row, you know, we're, we're not going to even welcome you to Mass or something like that. And, uh, you know, that can do a lot more harm than good. It, it's, it, it pushes people away rather than invites them in. What Pope Francis, I think, and much of Evangelicalism is talking about is not doing away with the, the doctrine and discipline of the Church but recognizing that we need to open up avenues for people to be welcomed back in by extending mercy, by extending forgiveness and, and reconciliation. And again, not in a simple perfunctory way, you know, that well, whatever it is, you know, just come on in, whatever, but really helping people to recognize where they're at in their lives, what they can uh, what they're being drawn to in the church and helping them to, to grasp that and take steps towards uh, being fully received into the church and, and fully welcomed back, uh, not through administrative roadblocks, but by by evangelization, by invitation, by welcoming, so that all truly are welcome uh, in our parishes. Uh, in many ways, it's about inviting us to be that, that sower planting seeds. Uh, and we know that... Uh, you know, the sower, when he sowed the seeds, you know, some fell on good soil, but much of it fell on bad. But the sower was generous with the seed. You know, the, the sower sowed with abandon. And so that's what we want to be as we go out into our communities and in our parishes, to sow with abandon and then gather in what does take root and, and to welcome those folks uh, into our parishes. So the next question I want to throw out there is, if, is your parish a place where disciples come together? Uh, if so, how? If not, what could be done to make it such a place? So take a few seconds and, and type a response in. Uh, I know the, the, the parish I grew up in, uh, outside of Kansas City, one of the ways in which they were really disciples coming together was they... Uh, entered into a partnering arrangement with a small community in El Salvador. Uh, and, you know, sometimes those kinds of relationships can just be economic, but it's just about sending money down there. And that certainly was a part of, of the parish I grew up in's relationship with this other community in El Salvador. But it was really about establishing relationship. And about twice a year, we would send groups of folks down there, uh, not to really even build buildings or to... Uh, uh, work the place, although there were certainly some aspects of that, but just to get to know the people. And whenever possible, this was back in the 80s, and so the, the political situation was still pretty tenuous. Uh, but as much as possible, we would bring people up from El Salvador to, to Kansas to come and visit us and to share their stories and to get to know us and in our community. Uh, and that relationship has extended even to till today. And so there's still a strong sense in that parish 
uh, that this is part of what we do as a community is we come together to support people you know thousands of miles away and to view them as part of our community to recognize that we are part of this universal church together uh, you know and that's that has not been an easy thing to maintain over all those years I, I'm sure um, but it's always had a, a real a special place in my imagination when I think about parishes and the life of a parish, uh, that a parish, when it's really looking outside of itself, can do amazing things even, even thousands of miles away. So we have some responses coming in here. Yes, my parish works together to help a parish in Africa, uh, but also work together locally to help charities, local charities. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, again, coming together to do those apostolic works are a wonderful uh, example of disciples coming together. Uh, Jane says, my parish offers so many opportunities to learn about our faith and to practice it. It's truly a wonderful parish. Good. Barbara says, yes and no. We are very welcoming and service-oriented, a sort of horizontal spirituality, but could be better vertically. Hmm. Meredith says, tough question. Recently, our parish has went through some changes, and people are not open to those changes. In the past, however, yes, we were very supportive and together. And, I, you know, that's always true, I think, whenever there's major changes in any community, whether it's a faith community or not. Uh, change is always a difficult process. Um, I spent a year in rural Iowa, uh, in a small town on the Mississippi and when we moved in, we had to, before we could formally join the parish, we had to sit down with the, the pastor. He always did this with new families coming in, meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. And during the course of that conversation, he said, now I want you to know, uh, you know we, we went from being five parishes in this town, uh, largely old ethnic parishes, to combining into one parish. And there's still a lot of hard feelings around that. And we're still really trying to, to come together as a parish. And we said, well, when did that happen? He said, 15 years ago. <laughs> Now, our experience was that the parish was extraordinarily welcoming, but I think it was largely out of that experience of that tough change of, of a lot of, of going from five parishes to one, and they really had to be intentional about being welcoming to one another uh, as they came together from five parishes into one, and that spilled over in, in our experience, at least, uh, 15 years later when we came in. We found them to be extraordinarily welcoming, uh, and just a, a wonderful parish, but I, I imagine uh, that was the fruit of some very tough times. Meg says, we're working hard on this, on hospitality, small faith communities. The invitation for small faith communities this summer was apostolate of the pews. I like that phrase. Uh, sit somewhere different next to folks you don't know. Introduce yourself. Ask a name. Invite to coffee. We have catechetical assemblies, opportunities for food and fellowship. Uh, I, I like that, apostolate of the pews. That's a, that's a great idea. You guys should trademark that. <laughs> Vicki says, yes, in many ways. I think it is fostered with mission speakers. Our church has Friday Eucharistic Adoration, weekly Bible study groups, helping Catholic charities, and teenagers participating in mission work. All great examples. Yeah. Michelle says, yes and no. Uh, the involved are extremely involved in every ministry, but the less involved and the Sunday-only parishioners far outnumber the fully engaged. I have found that in some ways the fully engaged are a bit exclusive and inadvertently alienate the disengaged. That can be a real danger in parish life when you have people who are so involved uh, that it can be a little off-putting to people who would like to get involved but uh, don't know how or or are told, well, you know, this is our job here, so we'll find something else for you. Uh, you know, finding room in existing ministries for people who are interested and want to be involved, uh, that's a real challenge, I think. So uh, that's good that you recognize that in your parish, and I, I hope uh, that they find some opportunities to uh, be more welcoming in those uh, established settings. Uh, Francis says, in my parish, we feel like blood members of the same family. I feel I am needed there, and I know I need my brothers and sisters to live out the message of Jesus. I think the most important ingredient in fostering that feeling is the fellowship after Mass, where we get to know and meet each other, and that, too, in the context of a meal. Absolutely. Again, the importance of sharing meal together. Uh, Tamara says... We have many opportunities to evangelize, and we have discipleship groups. However, it seems that it's usually the same 30 to 40 percent that participate in anything. We still struggle getting the other 60 percent to participate. Uh, that can be frustrating, but uh, I'll tell you, Tamara, if you actually have got 30 to 40 percent, you're way ahead of the curve. Uh, you know, typically, we see it's it's anywhere from five, I would say, to 15 percent of any given parish that is really truly involved. Uh, so, if you're at 30 to 40 percent, uh, I 
you know, certainly, you know, we can always do better, but that's actually not a bad starting place. Uh, Meg says, we also have a welcome ministry with a table outside once a month. Liz says, yes, from our weekly food pantry collections to our high school music ministry to our small faith-sharing groups to our knitting crocheting group who makes blankets for those who need anointing to our prayer group who gathers weekly to pray for prayer intentions. Yeah, all great examples of disciples coming together in the parish setting. Uh, Meg says, uh, sorry, engaged versus disengaged, good point, we are very aware of that. Using dynamic Catholic themes to keep aware of a tendency to be exclusive. Good. Wonderful. So some great examples there of uh, what it means to be parishes coming together uh, to, as we said, do the things disciples do. Uh, because we need each other, because no one individual of us, no one small group of us can do everything that the church is called to do. Uh, there is so much that we are called to as church to participate in and be and do uh, that we need each other. Uh, I always uh, like to tell the story of a Dominican priest I know uh, who I he, we studied together in graduate school when he was a student brother and I was doing my MA work. And he came from a very interesting religious background. He started out as Southern Baptist, uh, went into kind of New Age mysticism, uh, then Anglican for a while, and finally became Catholic, and, and now, as I said, is a Dominican priest. And he said one of the biggest differences uh, from when he was a Baptist to when he was Catholic was, when he was a Baptist, he would read the scriptures and read all the things that disciples are asked to do. And he would read that as he had to do every single one of those things. So he had to uh, shelter the homeless and, and feed the hungry and, and go and make disciples and, and do all these different things. And he said it was just overwhelming and, and in many ways just unattainable. And he said one of the great gifts when he became Catholic was recognizing that he was part of the body of Christ, and every body part has its function. So he didn't necessarily need to do every single one of those things. He just needed to find what he was called to do. And all of us together, as disciples, coming together uh, in our various parishes and, and groups and communities, that all of us can accomplish all these things that no one of us can do on our own. So uh, when we come together, we can do so much more. We can truly fulfill uh, the call of Christ to, to make a difference in our world. All right, so our last section tonight, then, is on looking at Christians in the wider culture, because Christians aren't just members of families. We're not just members of parishes. We're called to live in the world. Uh, we're, you know, we don't have much of a choice of that. We, we exist in the world. We have to be there. Uh, but we're not just called to kind of segregate ourselves into a Catholic ghetto and, and turn our back on all the people around us. We're called to be salt. We're called to be leaven. We're called to be light in the world. Um, we're to do all these things uh, in the world. And yet, I wonder sometimes if Christians aren't perceived that way, that we're not perceived as being a gift to the world, of being a gift of self to the world, uh, but rather we're just kind of seen as curmudgeons, as uh, people who uh, aren't there to bring joy and light and salt in the world, uh, but we just... Uh, you know, bring our no's and our denunciations and our anathemas and, and all that into the world. And yet we know that's not what we're called to be in the world. Uh, we're called to live the faith joyfully in the world. Uh, you know, we should be people who are set apart because of uh, the great joy that we have in Christ. And yet, unfortunately, I don't think that's always the case, at least in, in the eyes of the, uh, the world. So I would like to propose... Uh, what some people have started to call affirmative orthodoxy as kind of a fundamental Christian stance uh, in the world. And by affirmative orthodoxy, uh, which is a term that was coined by John Allen in 2008, uh, we mean starting with the joy that we bring into the world, starting with what we as Christians can affirm, rather than what we... Uh, deny in the world. Uh, this was the way John Allen put it. By affirmative orthodoxy, I mean a tenacious defense of the core elements of classic Catholic doctrine, but presented in a relentlessly positive key. Uh, Pope Benedict appears convinced that the gap between the faith and, and contemporary secular culture, which Paul VI called the drama of our time, has its roots in Europe dating from the Reformation 
the wars of religion, and the Enlightenment, with a resulting tendency to see Christianity as a largely negative system of prohibitions and controls. In effect, Benedict's project is to reintroduce Christianity from the ground up in terms of what it's for rather than what it's against. Now, in the article where John Allen laid this out, he gave two examples of what he meant by affirmative orthodoxy. Uh, first, he pointed to Pope Benedict's encyclical Deus Caritas Est, uh, God is Love, in which he said Pope Benedict laid out a philosophical and spiritual basis for the Church's teachings on human love. So starting with love, starting that as the basic uh, starting point for Christianity, that God is love, and so in human love we see what, it, what God is. But also in that encyclical, Pope Benedict said that being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. In other words, Christianity doesn't start with its moral law. It doesn't start with right and wrong. It doesn't start with uh, the yeses and nos of the faith, as it were. But it starts with a radical encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. And so we always have to start there in our catechesis, in our evangelization. Uh, we have to start with that encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, the second example that Alan gave in that article was, uh, you may recall back in 2007, uh, Pope Benedict, after consultation with various uh, theological bodies, decided to set aside the church's traditional teaching on limbo. Uh, now, limbo was the teaching that unbaptized babies, because they're unbaptized, they can't really enter into heaven. They can't have that perfect eternal happiness with God. But at the same time, it's not any fault of their own, and so they're not condemned to hell, but so they just kind of exist in this kind of natural state of happiness. Not a supernatural happiness, not happiness with God, but there's just this kind of natural happiness for all time. Now, this was never an official doctrine of the church. It was more like a, a theological opinion, uh, just kind of something that kind of gives us an out for trying to understand what happens to unbaptized babies should they die. Uh, but the church, uh, the, the Pope Benedict decided to set that aside. Now, in doing that, he didn't mean to soften the church's teaching on, uh, on baptism and that baptism is, is essential for salvation. Rather, what he chose to do was re-emphasize uh, that we have hope in Christ, uh, that we have hope in God, that God will do right for us. And so what Pope Benedict chose to say was, you know, limbo, you know, there's, there's nothing in our tradition that really says limbo is a, is a reality. So rather, what we're going to say is that when an unbaptized child dies, uh, that we entrust them to the mercy of God, and that in that mercy we hope that God will embrace and welcome that child into eternal happiness. So again, it wasn't about changing the church's teaching on baptism, but it was about re-emphasizing the mercy of God and the compassion of God. That's what Pope Benedict hoped to do by reframing that question about what happens to, to unbaptized children. I think he put it most succinctly, though, in a, a an interview in 2006 when Pope Benedict said, Christianity, Catholicism, isn't a collection of prohibitions, it's a positive option. It's very important that we look at it again because this idea has almost completely disappeared today. We've heard so much about what is not allowed that now it's time to say we have a positive idea to offer. In other words, again, we don't start with the church's nose, but we have to start with what we believe because ultimately people are not going to be attracted through negativity. They're not going to be attracted by a series of no, no's, no's. People are attractive when you have something to offer them, when you have a positive idea, when you have a, a positive proposition, when you can say, this is what we believe, not this is what we don't believe. I always like to liken this to uh, disciplining a child. Uh, you know, they often say that when disciplining a child, you shouldn't say, don't do that. Uh, now, you know, if a kid's about to run out into the street, certainly say, don't run into the street. But, but good discipline doesn't say the negative, it says the positive. Uh, because when you just say, you know, don't do that, you know, don't throw the ball in the house, well, you're just telling what not to do, but you're not telling them what they should be doing. You're not giving them the positive behavior that you want to reinforce. And so, and those of you who have young children may have seen this, you tell them one no, and then they just go to a different behavior that you also have to say no to, and they just move to another behavior that you have to say no to. If you start at the beginning by saying, don't throw the ball in the house, please keep the ball in your lap or, you know, 
put it, you know, that belongs outside, throw the ball outside. You know, if you start at the beginning, then you can just reinforce the positive behavior that you want them to do and start out on the right foot. I actually think it's very similar to what we're talking about with affirmative orthodoxy. Start with the positive. Start with what we believe. We'll get to what we don't believe. We'll get to what we, we can't affirm. But if we don't start from the positive, if we don't start with the stance of this is what we have and hold and, and believe to be true, then it's just going to take us a long time to get around to that. It's going to take a long time for us to finally get to the point where we're forming people to be disciples based on what we believe rather than just a series of prohibitions. Now, again, this doesn't mean that we're seeking to uh, whitewash the church's teaching or soft pedal on some of the hard issues. Uh, it's about emphasizing the positive and the affirmative. So, for instance, uh, a good example of this is the church's teaching on closed communion, that the church believes that reception of the Eucharist uh, should only be done once someone has fully entered and fully initiated into the church. So we don't offer uh, the Eucharist to our Protestant brothers and sisters or to non-Christians, etc. Now this can often be seen uh, on the other side, as it were, by Protestants uh, as the church being hard and being negative and, and denying them something, denying them the Eucharist. But in fact, what it's really about, the positive uh, teaching on that, is that the Eucharist is the sacrament of unity, that that participating in communion reflects participation in the body of Christ, that is the church. And it also reflects our belief in the real presence of Christ. So our belief is if you're going to receive communion, that reflects that you are a member of this body. You are participating in the communion of this church. And so if we were to offer Eucharist to our Protestant brothers and sisters, it would in fact be saying, it would be overlooking the real differences that we have. Uh, We'd be saying that it doesn't matter that you're not in union. It doesn't matter that we have these differences. In effect, we'd be whitewashing those differences. And so we're seeking to affirm the Eucharist as a sacrament of unity. That's why we then have to say no to extending that to other people outside of the Catholic Church. So what does affirmative orthodoxy have to do with the relationship of the church to the wider culture? Well, again, it's the emphasis on the positive, uh, and especially of joy. And joy is kind of the charism of the new evangelization. Uh, in the opening address that he gave at the Synod on New Evangelization a couple years ago, uh, Cardinal Wuerl cited joy as one of the charisms of the new evangelization. He said, when we look around and see the vast field open, waiting for us to sow seeds of new life, we must do so with joy. Our message should be one that inspires others joyfully to follow us along the path to the kingdom of God. Joy must characterize the evangelizer. Ours is a message of great joy. Christ is risen. Christ is with us. Whatever our circumstances, our witness should radiate with the fruits of the Holy Spirit, including love, peace, and joy. And again, joy doesn't come from what we deny. Joy only comes from what we can affirm. Joy only comes when we have something positive to offer people. And so if we are to evangelize the world, if we're to go out and be leaven and be salt and be light in this world, we have to do so with joy because joy will attract others. Joy will make people ask, what is it about this particular people? What is it they have that makes them love so, that makes them so joyous and, and, and buoyant? So our last question for tonight, for tonight, then, is who do you know that is an example of a joyful Christian? Uh, and perhaps relatedly, how can you live this type of faith publicly? How can you be someone who lives joyfully in the world uh, and not just someone who uh, is, a, is a Christian curmudgeon, as it were? Uh, because uh, quite honestly, I think we have, we have enough of them uh, in this world. So right away, Barbara says Cardinal Dolan. Absolutely. I think Cardinal Dolan is a wonderful example uh, of Christian joy in the world. Uh, he just radiates it. He just beams with, uh, with that light. Uh, Nicole says, I feel my friend Lana is a joyful Christian. Good. You know, it's wonderful when we can have friends like that, people that we know uh, when we see and talk to, that they're going to bring joy and just radiate the joy of faith. Uh, in our lives. It, it makes it a little bit easier uh, <laughs> to, to be out there in the, the rough and tumble, as it were. Very good. I'll give folks a few more 
minutes to answer the question. Our PSR leader, says Patricia, our theme for PSR last year was joy. Uh, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. <laughs> Uh, Joe says, the people I follow on social media, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's been one of the great joys in my life participating in things like Twitter and, and Facebook and so on, is, is seeing so many joyful Christians, so many joyful Catholics, uh, and, and seeing them find their place in the world, especially, it's kind of bittersweet at times. Uh, I've had a couple of instances where I followed people who have entered religious communities, and, and often uh, cloistered communities. I think of one young lady in particular a year or two ago who, uh, who entered the Carmelites. And it was really interesting. I just happened to be on Twitter when she was saying her goodbyes, and uh, all of a sudden her Twitter account was gone. She had, she had closed it down, and she was off to join the 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 Carmelites, but just the, the joy that she brought to Twitter in, in discovering her path and, and sharing with others was wonderful. Michelle says, Mr. Patrick was always joyful in often adverse personal circumstances until his passing. Uh, Michelle says, Pope Francis, another great example. Uh, Kristen says, young children who are eager to learn about the life of Jesus Christ. Yeah, You know, there's great wisdom in what Jesus had to say about people needing to be like little children to enter the kingdom because they, they have that joy and they have it naturally. Uh, Tamara says, so many of the catechists that I work with are joyful Christians. For me, living in joy is about being positive when your world is full of negative. Hard to do, but an amazing feeling when you accomplish it. Yeah, it is. Uh, Kayla says, a past priest that she knew. Jane says, Mother Teresa was a joyful Christian. Absolutely. She always seemed to have a smile on her face. Uh, Catherine says, a wonderful parishioner called Ethel. <laughs> uh, and Francis, second uh, uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, he effuses the joy of knowing Christ even when the society tests the church's positions on morality. To live this type of faith publicly, one needs a deep relationship with the Lord. Yeah. Uh, and Joe also says, I love seeing the joy on the youth I minister to that moment that it clicks with them. <laughs> yeah, once they get it, uh, they get it. And uh, it can be a real life-changing event for folks when, uh, when it all just suddenly comes into place. Well, wonderful. Uh, thank you again for, for participating in those questions uh, and your, uh, your answers to them. Uh, Nicole says real quick, my daughter, she tells me that Jesus is her superhero. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so with that, uh, we are just about at the end of our time. We have, uh, we have really, uh, plowed through tonight. So, uh, are there any last questions about anything in this presentation or any thoughts or comments you want to leave us with? Uh, I'll give folks a couple of minutes to, uh, type any of those in. I will remind folks that the video for this, uh, may take a day or two this time around. I'm going to see if I can go through and, and fix up this video after the fact since we had some problems with the PowerPoint here at the end. I'll try to get those slides fixed in the video before I post it, but uh, either tomorrow or the day after that video will be posted uh, on the uh, Building a Better Disciple website along with the slides so you can follow along with those. Next week, we'll be discussing liturgy and prayer and what they mean for the life of a disciple, both our individual prayer lives and our communal prayer uh, within the larger church. Uh, comment from Liz, the definition of parish was as a place, but isn't it more of a gathering of people? Uh, it's, I, you know, I think that's a great Catholic both and. Uh, a, a parish is definitely a geographical region, uh, and we know parishes have... Uh, boundaries and such. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, I think especially when we look at what Pope Francis is saying in the Evangelii Gaudium is a parish is more than just the building. It's more than just the geographical region. It's about what people come together to do. It's what we come together as disciples uh, to do together. So absolutely, I think that's a both and. A, a parish is a place and it's also a gathering of people. Uh, Francis says, you have given a very honest assessment of the parishes living out of Christ's message, uh, and I thank you for factually representing reality. You know, I, I don't believe in, in whitewashing the challenges we face in our parishes. Uh, and we've all had, I, I'm sure, good and bad experiences uh, in our current parishes and in past parishes. So, you know, we, we have to face those realities square on, or, or we're never going to be able to uh, truly move beyond the problems that we face and, and get them fixed. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm never one for uh, not being honest about about uh, the challenges that we face in the church. 
All right, uh, so for our closing prayer tonight, uh, I am going to use the uh, collect prayer from the Mass for the Church, uh, which is a really a nice, I think, succinct little prayer here uh, to uh, end our conversation tonight on community. So again, I invite you to uh, find yourself a, a quiet spot to relax and enter into prayer of, for God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, in the covenant of your Christ, you never cease to gather to yourself from all nations, a people growing together in unity through the Spirit. Grant, we pray, that your Church, faithful to the mission entrusted to her, may continually go forward with the human family and always be the leaven and the soul of human society, to renew it in Christ and transform it into the family of God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all again for your participation tonight. I look forward to seeing you all next week uh, when we discuss liturgy and prayer. Have a great evening, and God bless.